Hi everyone, for those of you just joining, we're gonna wait a little bit of time and we'll get started here shortly. Thank you so much for joining. For those of you just joining us, we're gonna get started here shortly. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll get started here in a couple of seconds. All right, hello and welcome everyone. I am Priyanka Bakta and welcome to today's webinar, Survey Results, Business Values, um, and the Role of PR and Communications More Than Ever. Today's speakers are Edward Lundquist, uh, Chief Executive uh, Engagement Officer for Echo Bridge LLC, and Frank Strong, Founder and President of SWORD and the Script Media LLC. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few reminders. During this presentation, all participants are in a listen-only mode, but throughout the presentation, feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A box down below in your Zoom toolbar. Our speakers will address these questions during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. If you have any trouble connecting to audio or video, uh, video, please let me know in the chat box, and I'm happy to help you troubleshoot. And finally, a recording of today's presentation will be made available on the IABC website shortly after the end of today's presentation. And now with that, I'd like to pass it over to our speakers, Fred and Ned, uh, Frank and Ned, <laughs> to kick things off. Wow, I just like combined your names. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. Many thanks to the IABC for having us. Um, really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, the JOTW survey is the third year. This is the third time we've done, excuse me, fourth time we've done this. Um, and uh, let Ned just talk briefly. We, we end up surveying subscribers to his job of the week newsletter. And Ned, you want to say a few things about um, the, the demographics this year? Yeah, thanks, Frank. So uh, job of the week network uh, is uh, tw 20 years old now, uh, just about, and uh, is a network of about 5,900 communication professionals. And we reach out to that network each year, Frank and I. And we ask a series of questions. There, there have been some uh, updates to the questions over the last four years, but primarily we're looking at the same information because we're very interested in, in uh, looking at trends and trying to see how things might be uh, changing or evolving in our profession. So uh, this year uh, we had 300 uh, communication professionals that responded uh, to our survey and we're grateful for them. And uh, demographic wise, uh, both Frank and I uh, noted that they're relatively senior. So uh, the, these are not entry-level people for the most part, uh, people with uh, it, probably at least 10 years of, of experience by and large. And uh, I think that that uh, gives us uh, a little bit of credibility with our, with our answers because uh, they uh, are from people that have a great deal of visibility into our industry. Uh, we also this year, I'll let Frank talk a little bit about this, but we invited some guest reviewers to look at our uh, responses and give us sort of their take on it as well. So Frank, you might want to mention uh, how, who we picked and, and uh, how they contributed. Yeah, we will do. Um, thanks for that, Ned. Uh, let's see, next slide, there we go. Yeah, so our mug shots and bios, we will definitely have slides for you. You can go take a look at this um, afterwards. We won't go through all of that. There are some lines crossed out and there are some bullets that are in green. This is basically the, um, the agenda for the full report. And it's you know 56 slides long. We obviously cannot get through all of that in a single sitting. So what you see in green is what we are going to cover today. And uh, the line through, just to let you know, there's a full report out there with some, some more information, including um, demographics that you can look at in detail uh, at your leisure. Um, these are the contributors that uh, Ned mentioned. If you uh, notice on the bottom right hand side, those are probably faces uh, that are very familiar to the IABC community. Um, Shell Holtz, who I believe is also a fellow, and Shanali Burke, who's very uh, active in the community and has been for a long time. Many thanks to our contributors. It was the first year that we had contributors, so they had a chance to weigh in on both the questions and provide some analysis, and we'll be highlighting um, a few of their comments there. There's a nice executive summary for you. Um, we're gonna skip over that and get right to the big question. And what we'll do is we'll sort of tee up the data and then have a brief discussion on it. Um, when we uh, pulled this survey, we were about a year into the pandemic. And so we wanted, we, we thought the, the, uh, the vaccine, vaccine was coming. It looked like we were getting towards the end there. We've done a couple of stutter steps with Delta and, uh, and now Omicron. 
But at that time, it looked like we were looking, we were seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And we asked folks, you know, what's the value of, of PR in the wake of um, the pandemic? And 80%, you know, either agreed or strongly agreed uh, that organizations find greater value. We took that one step further and asked them about functions. What is it specifically um, that we listed out what we think are the seven primary functions in, in the communicator? Uh, that the communicator, the communication shop fills. And uh, what you can see there in green is strongly agree and blue is agree. And employee communications is way at the top of the list followed by customer comms, partner comms. Probably not surprising in hindsight, we've had a lot of time to think about it, but I think in the moment um, that was interesting. Ned, did you have any reaction to this particular um, data point? No, I think uh, the... Uh... The, the number of people that are in internal and employee communications, uh, that's somewhat indicative of maybe the, the demographics I have in my newsletter. I think the number of people that in, in mentioned uh, media relations is actually a little bit smaller than I would have thought, but uh, uh, I, I think so many people also have to deal with media that that would have been uh, important and uh, reaching out and dealing with media uh, is something that uh, many people have to do now because they can't run into them uh, physically, or they can't uh, go to uh, media events or availability. So I'm a little surprised that that's uh, not as high. Yeah, that word uncertainty is obviously uh, overused. Uh, it's almost become cliche, but when you talk about communicating with uh, key, key stakeholders, particularly uh, employees, internal comms, that's a big question when you hit this pandemic and everything was, we weren't sure how it was all gonna shake out. The, the leadership was like, oh gosh, what are we gonna say? And you turn to your communicators when that's going to happen or when that does happen. Um, I thought it was interesting. Here's a couple of points from uh, Karen and from Chanali. Um, this was their comments uh, uh, in reaction to the data. And they both kind of pointed out the breadth and depth. Um, so this comes up a couple of times. Sometimes uh, communications PR is used interchangeably with media relations. And yet those of us that are in the profession know we do a whole lot more than just that. Um, some people, you know, if you're focused on internal comms, you don't do any media relations. And I thought that really shone through in, uh, in some of the data points here. Uh, anything else to, uh, to add to this, Ned? No, I think that these comments kind of underscore the fact that uh, what we've been dealing with over the past year and are continuing to deal with. So the, the comments will be relevant in the next survey that we're going to do early next year uh, is that we're, we're dealing with a crisis in slow motion. Uh, this is not like a, a, a mass shooting at your company uh, or uh, some uh, problem with a senior executive that suddenly uh, gets the market all spun up. This is a, a the pandemic has been a crisis for every one of our organizations uh, and it's in slow motion. So I, I think that this has given us a chance to not only provide our crisis uh, communications expertise, but to do it over a long period of time. So it's not just reactionary. We're really able to, to be uh, proactive in, in how we prepare uh, our organizations or uh, allow our organizations to respond. Yeah, that's right on cue, Ned, uh, because one of the, uh, the next questions that we asked was just about the office environment. Remember, these results came out in March, April of 2021. So again, um, getting towards, we thought we were getting towards the end of the pandemic. We were seeing some end and most folks, uh, we asked them what, what was gonna to happen to the work environment. Most folks believe they were gonna have some sort of um, hybrid environment. I do know there are a number of organizations that, uh, you know, as we got to the end, we're like, okay, that's it. We're gonna have everybody back in the office, come on back. And then a Delta variant hit and they had to put those on pause. And then uh, we thought we were kind of getting to the end of that. And now the Omicron one comes along. So it, the slow motion, I think, is, a, is an apt term, and uh, it will be really interesting to see what these results look like uh, next year. But I imagine hybrid with, uh, with remote policies is probably the way, the way of the future for, uh, for the foreseeable future. All right. Um, any, anything else, Ned? No. All right, we'll move on to the next section. So this one was pretty interesting. We asked about the top challenges um, facing PR. This is a, a question that we have asked every year. One of the things that you'll notice right off the bat is there isn't a single uh, challenge that has uh, a simple majority. None of those have 50%. 
So really organizations that are facing an eclectic mix, they may be unique in your environment. I also wanna point out uh, number six on the list is uh, not enough budget, right? And number eight on the list is measurement and ROI. And if some of those uh, details are hard to see, here's the next slide with this. this that was a graphical representation. This just listed out so you can read all of the, uh, the obstacles that they have um, or that we have listed on the survey. But we we uh, we were surprised about budget because uh, in years past, as you can see, go go to that next that next slide, Frank. Uh, you can see that uh, in the past, budget has been the top challenge, uh, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. Why that uh, took such a dive from the top down towards the bottom? Uh, I uh, maybe it's because some of the work that we're doing from home. Uh, uh, is, is low cost. Once you do whatever investment is, you need to set up a home office for your people. Uh, I'm not sure. I just don't quite understand why that uh, became such a big change. Well, I think there's definitely an element of the, the value that people see in communications, right? They know that they needed them. So maybe perhaps that came less of a challenge. Ned's absolutely right. In 2018, you can see that budget was top of the list. Uh, 2018, 2019 fell to fourth place in 2020 and then to uh, sixth place in 21. Same thing with proving ROI. Now we did change that question slightly. Every year we try to improve our questions, make the survey a little better, but third place in 2018, it was in sixth place in 2019, and it was the top challenge in 2020. Um, so the, I think the results that year came out in January or February. So it was just prior to the pandemic or just as the pandemic was hitting. Um, going into that year, not knowing what was coming, Communicator said uh, ROI was going to be the top challenge, and that that sort of fell off. Again, it seems to sync up with the idea that the leadership team values uh, communicators more in, in, uh, in these uncertain times. Um, okay, uh, one of the things that we wanted to ask is if if uh, what, what will this do to your structure? Right, in years past, we have seen a broad trend that uh, many PR organizations were beginning to bring and comms shops bringing staff in-house. They were growing their teams at the expense of agencies. This is also reflective of trends that I've seen in other research across marketing, right? And across, across creative teams, which I think have an awful lot in common with comms. They tend to be, um, uh, you know, a, a specialist group that sometimes works with marketing, sometimes works with other parts of the organization. Uh, but they were all kind of going in-house. And we could see this last year uh, where, you know, uh, too many priorities was top of the list. That really changed. And you've got more than half, one and two, really saying they're going to send more work um, to outside agencies to include, you know, freelancers and independent consultants, which I think there's a, a big population of that in the IABC community. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, it's been, you know, very good for the independent consultant. Ned, what, what was your take? Uh, well, you know, a few years ago, uh, companies, organizations were downsizing, uh, they were eliminating the middle level people. Uh, they cut a lot of their staff, but in many cases they took their staff that they cut and then retained them, uh, as freelancers or consultants to do things like the annual report or the company newsletter, yeah. but not as full-time employees. So I think that maybe we're seeing a shift back, uh, the pendulum swinging. Yeah, I agree. Um, and and Stacy uh, kind of cued in on that a little bit too, saying, you know, look at those who are responsible. You know, in a smaller organization, uh, if you're in a comms position and you've got both internal and external comms, you're definitely overwhelmed. You're definitely looking for help, um, and that's you know one of the strategies she's obviously employed. Um, media relations is the next data point that we'll cover. This is one of the uh, traditional venerable questions on the survey that we've asked um, year over year. No surprise, 50% say it's getting harder or much harder. Uh, you got about one in three, 35% saying it's about the same. However, when you look at the prior year numbers, uh, in 2020, it was 75% saying media relations was getting harder or much harder. So the trend line certainly suggests that media relations is not getting any easier, continues to be uh, very difficult. Uh, I'll just pause there, Ned, see if you've got anything to add before we jump. Yeah, to and, and maybe if the it's not quite 
as daunting maybe as it was in the last few surveys uh, that may be because we we're really adjusting to conducting a lot of media relations online uh, in the last decade we've kind of done this uh, transition and uh, there are still some Luddites out there like me uh, but uh, I, I think it's becoming more and more much more mainstream uh, so maybe that makes the whole process a little bit easier. That's just a, a guess. All right. Um, one of the things that we asked this year uh, that was different from surveys last year is, you know, we asked them, what are you doing about it? Um, if media relations is getting harder, is your level of investment in media relations going to stay the same or is it going to grow? And the vast majority said it's going to stay the same. So if it's valuable to you and you're going to do the same things as last year, uh, then you probably can expect the same results. Um, and um, one of the uh, one of the interesting things that came up, I think, amongst the um, the contributors was very different views. So Michael Smart, if you know him, um, candidly, he's he's probably one of the, uh, the 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 best sources of information on media relations. So every time an article comes out with about you know a blog post about 10 tips for media relations i kind of my eyes glaze over because they all kind of say the same thing i haven't seen anything new or different in the last 20 years but i'll tell you michael smart who is a former journalist who now does um training on media relations always has something really uh interesting to say uh, and he brings up some nuance or some detail and i was really surprised to see somebody like him come back and say look there may be some diminishing returns uh, because it's getting harder. It's gonna take more effort to get the same results. Uh, but then of course he points out there is some silver lining the upside. Um, Shell on the other hand had a very different perspective that uh, just because it's harder doesn't diminish its value. Maybe in fact, it makes it um, more valuable. I'll pause there Ned in case you have something you wanna chime in with. Uh, no, other than the fact that I, that's a, a really key point that uh, those who excel at it are, are still gonna get a great deal of value from the, from from engaging, uh, and and Shell I think uh, concurs that uh, uh, you got to be good at it. You can't just expect people to pick up your stories. You can't just expect expect people to follow up on uh, your releases. Uh, there's a lot of work involved, and you got to be good at it. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe also because there's so many more. Uh, maybe maybe I might call them pseudo media. Uh, sort of blog posters, influent, influencers uh, that that are not the uh, sort of mainstream print trade professional uh, journals, uh, broadcast, any of that kind of, yeah, there are all kinds of online uh, media now. So there's, there is more people to reach out to. So that, that also might make it hard. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do an awful lot of media relations and I typically have, you know, three, three, um, pillars of advice, if you will. The, the first one is make sure your news is easy to find. Websites get updated, they get changed. Um, we've gotten away from the online newsroom. If you go to, uh, just check out your own newsroom, but I, I know I, I look at a lot of different vendor websites and the newsroom is hard to find. In other words, you can't find a chronological list of press releases. It's hard to distinguish between the press release and, and coverage that they've actually had. It may be difficult to find contact information for people that you can reach out to. I'll tell you, and I just checked this before, um, before this webinar to, to make sure, but there is a, one of the major press release um, distribution companies no longer has a place for contact information. It absolutely blows my mind that you would spend $1,200, $2,500 on a press release uh, to, to make an announcement to the media and, and then not have contact information in there. Um, and the easy way behind that is put it in the text at the bottom so someone can find it years later. I, I might also add that that uh, the media have the same problem. I, I look at lots of uh, media to try to reach out and find out if they're interested in something that I have to offer. And it's uh, it's very spotty. A lot of them, it's really hard to find who the editors are, who the contacts are, uh, how to submit something. Really hard. And yep. that blows me away because they should be very open to receiving uh, material. And it should be very obvious uh, for somebody who's trying to find out who to contact. Yeah. If um, if media relations is getting harder, we have to execute on the fundamentals well. So it's worth just doing a quick audit, make sure that you've got your news is easy to find, you've got contact information. 
The second piece I give is supplement your pitching, right? Everybody, you know, we can write good pitches, good subject lines, timing, all of those traditional factors are important. When I say supplement, I'm thinking of specifically um, social media. So one of, uh, one of the tools in my toolkit is paid social ads targeted at journalists. 95% uh, of journalists are on Twitter. They tend to run in bunches. They follow each other. Uh, it's a very passive way to buy some Twitter ads targeted at reporters in your vertical market to be timed with the same day that you're making a launch. Uh, maybe they don't get to check their inbox, but I guarantee you they're on Twitter and they're looking at it. And there's a chance they might see it and be able to follow up with you. But adding some paid media for earned media sake, if you will, and it doesn't have to be a lot, um, an announcement with one or $200 behind some Twitter ads, a very uh, small investment, very pragmatic and get good results from it. I've been doing it for years. Um, and then the last piece I'd say is, we have to make sure that we do more with the coverage that we get it. What you do with the coverage you get is just as important as getting it in the first place because the news cycle moves so fast. So, you know, putting it on a newsroom, making sure that we're sharing it either internally with an email or on Slack or some other internal comms channel. Um, and I also am a big fan of boosting those posts, right? Promoting those on social media, getting some visibility, spreading that third party validation um, elsewhere. And so those are the kind of the three pieces I, I like to get, cover down on media relations. Ned, any, anything else that you would add here? No, no. Okay. We will move on to uh, views on uh, political and social issues. So in years past, we asked a question about politics. There's an awful lot of noise. Should brands take a stand in politics? Um, and we noticed there's some different answers in the uh, sentiment analysis uh, between uh, political and social issues. So this year, we broke them out into two different questions. Should brands take stands on a social issue? Should brands take a stand on a political issue? And, and by far and large, um, you know, it's maybe one in five say you should take a stand on political issues, always or often. Uh, and it's about double that, that say you should take a stand on social issues, always or often, 43%. Now I have a build slide here because it was busy with text. But the inverse uh, sort of complements that, you know, there are more people that say you should not, brand should not take a stand on politics. That's 35%, so one in three versus um, social issues, which is 13%. Um, and then there's one keen observer noted, this is an open-ended comment someone wrote in there, you know, it's impossible to separate politics and social. Uh, and as one of my smart friends mentioned to me and, uh, and years prior that um, all social issues aren't inherently political, but social issues certainly do get um, politicized. Anything jump out uh, to you on uh, on this finding, Ned? Yeah, I, I think in the last couple of years, uh, there's been this polarization in the United States. Uh, and uh, if you take a stand on a social issue or political issue, uh, it, it may have some very strong uh, impact uh, on one side of the issue or the other, uh, and you may have to answer for that. It, it, if your CEO comes out and says something that infuriates a, a very vocal group, it may get a lot more play than it deserves. And uh, in, in my view, the whole, the whole landscape is fraught with danger right now getting out into political or social issues. That said, uh, a good social uh, corporate social responsibility program uh, <clears throat> that is, is not too polarized or um, d d doesn't, is, 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 is crafted in a very positive way, doing positive things, I think that it will probably uh, stand you in good stead. Uh, Coming out against something is gonna, gonna be, uh, I think, problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I tend to agree. You and, and I think the survey results showed some of the the sentiment analysis, the comments that people wrote in would point out. Look, there are times when you your business uh, is in an industry or makes sense to weigh in on a political issue. If you're a you know an outdoorsy sort of brand, I won't mention any names here, but you support the environment, makes sense. It's well nested with your environment with your uh, business goals that you would uh, support the environment. Same thing with um, tech companies and, and privacy regulation, right? It makes sense for the business to weigh in on that. Um, 
with respect to uh, social issues, I think there is a function of corporate communications um, or communications in general, if you're not working for a corporation, but in an organization that isn't always, um, in, in, you know, as, um, as, as first thought of, and that is, I think comms has a responsibility to be a conscience of the organization. And so there's something to said to be uh, dissuading brands from making statements on social issues and going ahead and getting involved, the act, you know, um, you don't have to say anything, just do it. If you want to be an inclusive organization, I think communications has a role to sort of champion that and, and word will get out whether you are or you aren't either way. Um, and that's, that's, you know, something of an idea that came up in, um, you know, some of the open-ended questions. These are some of the answers that we had. We had 20, 123 people. The question here was, if you are going to make a statement on politics or on social, how should you do it? And, um, you know, it's, I've highlighted there a couple of things that stood out for me is one, be clear, you know, be diplomatic, right? They're sensitive. This is common sense stuff. And then the last piece, don't flip flop, right? Be true to your word. If you're going to take a position, make sure it's well thought out and stick to it. Um, and you also mentioned, Frank, the, uh, the fact that uh, we communicators are sort of the social conscience of the organization to some extent. Uh, and communication is a two-way thing. So we're not, we don't only put stuff out, but we have our uh, eyes and ears out on the, uh, the universe and can uh, communicate back up through uh, leadership to let them know what we're hearing and what we're seeing, because that may uh, have some impact on, on what they're saying and the positions that they're taking, particularly if they're, it's not going over well. Yeah. Either, either beforehand uh, with, with your intuition or afterwards uh, with the feedback that you're getting. Yeah, great point. Um, great point. One of the things we wanted to ask um, with this question is there was, um, you know, obviously a lot of discussion about uh, there's, there's a whole lot more talk than action. So we put that question to respondents. We tried to put that question to respondents and, and asking them right afterward, do you think the actions your organization takes are consistent with the, um, with the message it strives to convey? And it's a clear majority here. Um, always or often, uh, comms thinks that uh, their organization does. Um, we took this one step further and asked a bit about uh, DE&I, diversity, e e equity, and inclusion and also uh, ESG, right? Um, environmental, social, and governments. Um, depending on where you're coming from, some people use these words as interchangeable. Some see them as a subset, like DE&I, for example, could fit under the social aspect of ESG. Um, we were, Ned and I were ch chatting with uh, Priyanka, our host, um, yesterday, and she mentioned, look, she came up through a background where uh, a lot of these things fit under a function called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. So the words change. We try to improve the survey every year. It's possible we may try to break these out um, next year. But I thought it was really interesting to uh, to see that uh, you know two and three organizations say they already have a program like this in place. And I'll pause there before we move on. Then uh, I I would uh, going back one slide, Frank. I, I think uh, a lot of times uh, people will say, "Oh yes, uh, our actions are very consistent with our messaging." I think maybe we are somewhat patting ourselves on the back there. It's very difficult for us to see the forest for the trees sometimes. Uh, so uh, I am somewhat skeptical sometimes when a commuter, communicator takes uh, some credit for, for that because it's not always the case. Yeah, great point. Uh, all right, this is the ESG and DEI slide. I'm going to move one forward so you know where you are. The people on this that answered yes, that 66%, we sent them to one additional question and we asked them this question. Was that position or that function created in response to the social crisis that unfolded in the US? So we saw a lot of social unrest, obviously protests um, in the US. It wasn't just here though, there were definitely incidents internationally. Um, we saw you know, similar social unrests or related social unrest issues in, you know, throughout Europe and other parts of the world. Um, but I was really uh, fascinated to see how many folks said no. In other words, they're saying these functions were already in place before those events unfolded. Um, and I thought that that caught me by surprise. I really anticipated um, uh, this answer to be yes. And it really is only about one in five 
of those uh, 66%, that's 199 respondents, about uh, two thirds of the 300 that took the, uh, the survey. Um, but I thought but, that, was but that also could be indicative of the fact that the terminology, because these terms, ESG, uh, DE, and, and I, I, they're new to me uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, that doesn't mean that the, the subject matter is entirely new, but the terminology may be new, the, the, the label. We may try to break this out next year. We'll see what we can do. Um, but I think it's, it's worth exploring. There's obviously a lot of attention around it. Uh, I see this. I do a lot of work in financial services as well, as well. And you see ESG coming up uh, considerably where there are um, you know, private equity and venture capital funds that are entirely dedicated to you know, sustainable foods. And so ESG funds has been kind of this thing that has uh, grown and there seems to be an awful lot of demand for it. Um, I just wanted to point out one additional contributor's um, comment here. So Shanali kind of pointed out, looking at alphabet soups being thrown around like nobody's business. A lot of it is, is lip service. Um, so hopefully we're, we're matching our words with our actions. And, um, you know, if our organizations aren't, then, you know, power to the folks for standing up and uh, putting a stake in the ground saying, hey, we can do better. Yeah. And just by declaring you have a executive who's responsible for DE&I doesn't mean that you have a program and you're, and you're making strides or uh, that, that you're actually accomplishing something. Yeah, wonderful. Um, all right, on to communications measurement. So this is the last section and we're at 1.30, so we're doing pretty good on time here. I'm gonna try to wrap this up in, uh, in 40 minutes and leave some time for questions at the end. I can see the, the Q and A's coming in. Um, the first question that we asked is, does your organization measure the results of its communication efforts? Um, and lo and behold, 60% say always or often. That seems like a pretty good result. And I'm not sure what's going on with the folks that say sometimes. But one of the benefits of doing this survey over time is we can see the results over time. And so what we did was, these are the results from 2020. So you had about 58%. Not a, not a huge margin, uh, but it, it did uh, tick up a little bit. And then we went back and looked at 2019. Now, it's worth noting, we did ask this question a little differently. Again, every year we try to ask better and better questions, make improvements. We get feedback, uh, both from the survey response and people that read it. And so we asked the question a little bit differently, but I think there's a notable difference here between the folks that do, uh, yes, and the folks that sort of kind of, and that was us trying to be funny because Ned, Ned's pretty uh, humorous in his communications with the community. Uh, if you subscribe to his newsletter, you'll see his humor. Um, but I, I think what this shows is some, uh, some remarkable progress that folks are more focused on communications. And so if we're thinking about ROI uh, falling down that list of top challenges, here's a good data point. Maybe folks are becoming more focused over time. There's been an awful lot of attention on uh, the need to measure. Um, and it's certainly important if we wanna hang on to that newfound appreciation we've gleaned over the last couple of years. Ned, what say you? So if you look at, uh, if you've ever entered the Gold Quill Award, for example, or PRSA Silver Anvil Award or a chapter award, uh, the first thing they wanna know is what kind of research you've done. How, how did you benchmark your communication issue uh, and how did that inform the, the goals that you set uh, and your plan? And did you also measure again to determine your result? And once you do that uh, successfully, then it becomes something that is ingrained in your processes and you, you do it for everything. And if you've ever seen someone who's won gold quill awards year after year after year, it's because they measure everything and they do it in that type of process where they're not just deciding a goal willy nilly, it's, it's based on a, where you're starting from and where you want to get to. And all that is a, 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 our metrics. So uh, we need to be measuring, we need to measure everything. So one of the, the questions that naturally comes out of this is what are people measuring? Uh, we did not ask this question in 2021. And the reason is this is the results from the 2019 survey uh, we've done, we did it in 2018, 2019, and 2020. The results are typically the same. So we consciously decided not to ask that question this year. We wanted to, we had the pandemic. We wanted to ask some different questions without the survey getting too long. But when you're looking at what are people measuring, um, these are the types of things that, uh, that respondents have said in years past and consistently over time, let's say they measure. 
Um, and just because we are consistently indicating that this is what we measure doesn't necessarily mean that all these things are the right things to measure. So I, I, I wouldn't take this uh, chart as your, as your uh, roadmap to measurement. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a three-step process here. Number one is understand what your goals are, match your metrics to goals. And when you've matched your, metri matched your metrics to goals, make sure you have a process for updating them. So we don't get into this world where we're kind of sort of measuring or um, we're so busy one month that we skip it. And, you know, then we're trying to pick it up again the next month. And there's, so there's gaps in the data. So creating a process that you stick to once you've identified your, uh, the metrics. And then lastly, I think is the automation piece. There's a role for technology. There's a whole lot of PR technology and comms technology that's coming out, but automate that last so that we make sure we get our processes dialed in. And you don't automate a bad process, right? We want to make sure we've got a good, good measure and then, and then go ahead and automate that. Uh, okay, that brings us to, oh, yes. We asked, um, well, this is one of the new questions we asked this year is, if you could have one thing, whoops. That's my pup falling. Sorry about that. Um, that's better than a cat walking across the screen, I guess. If uh, which is par for 2020 and 2021. But if you could have one thing um, to help you with your measurement efforts, what would it be? And I was really fascinated to see that measurement and know-how top the list. Uh, about one in five um, folks saying that. Ned, anything anything to add there? Yeah, and I, uh, budget is not necessarily what you need to measure, although. Uh, I, I've heard uh, some measurement gurus say uh, investing in measurement sometimes is more than the more worthwhile than just in investing in the the uh, the execution uh, your rollout. But uh, leadership support is super important too because uh, you have to you have to sell your plan to management wh whatever your plan is, uh, and they have to know what you're measuring and how that's how that becomes the the uh, what charts your roadmap to, to success, uh, they have to support that too. So the, I would say that uh, measurement know-how and leadership support are, are really, really important. Yeah, and then, you know, budget may not necessarily just go towards uh, like a technology tool, but it could go towards staff. And, um, you know, if, you're, uh, if you went into comms because you don't like math, maybe that's a good opportunity to think about bringing somebody in in a role that is a, you know, a statistician. Can help you pull together a dashboard, kind of an operations type role, if you will. Um, in terms of measurement know-how, I've got one tip to offer that is the easiest tip that anybody can do, and that is go take the Google Analytics classes. They're online, they're free. Um, it will give you. It's they're not easy. It is a long course. Uh, you have to put some time in. If you remember, there was a few years ago, um, the firm that is a firm called Shift Communications. I think they've long since been acquired. Um, at least there's, there's been some, I have to go check that. There's been some turnover in the leadership, but they made quite a bit of name uh, for themselves. Um, they hired folks like Chris Penn, who's a real kind of manage, measurement guru. They made a name for themselves by getting everybody in their organization, Google Analytics certified. Um, so whether you're in-house or at an agency, you cannot go wrong. It's free. It will benefit you for the rest of your career. Um, and that's that concludes the measurement section. We've got one last section we want to cover on uh, on organizational structure and reporting. Um, I'll show you two quick slides here. We'll get a quick reaction and then we'll start to wrap it up and go towards questions. But we asked um, communications teams, who do you currently report to, right? And it's about a three-way tie between a chief communications officer, the CEO and the CMO. Um, I can tell you from experience in B2B technology space, so uh, PR and marketing tends to be well aligned. You often find PR or a Mark Homs, more of a Mark Homs function reporting to the CMO. But we also asked this question a different way, and that is, who should comms report to? And uh, you, know, you see quite a bit of a jump for the, the chief comms officer. So there's a, a whole lot of um, support for bringing someone in with a C-suite title, working uh, and championing the, uh, the communications uh, function. And then the next largest would be CEO, and, that, and then CMO falls off uh, rather precipitously. Ned, any, um, any reaction here? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I'm very pleased that everybody on this slide agrees that uh, they shouldn't be reporting to legal or general counsel. Uh, but that is the case in a lot of organizations. Uh, also, I was surprised at how many people put down, uh, you know, didn't put down HR because HR quite often will have their own communication uh, 
team. And that makes sense to me because uh, the, the products that they're selling, if you will, is very different than what the client relations people uh, or the business to business relations people, uh, the forward uh, looking, uh, outward looking communicators. Uh, when, when you're trying to make people aware of a new benefits plan uh, or you're trying to get people ready for an acquisition or people uh, ready for a big uh, reorg or a, a big move of spaces, uh, those, are, those are important communication uh, pro e efforts, but they're not marketing. And so it, it, yeah. it might require a totally separate team to be looking at that. Yeah, I definitely I would add to that too. Just a little defense of the lawyers, if we have any uh, listening or in the audience. Um, I spent quite a bit of time at LexisNexis, which uh, you know, big primary part of their business is legal research. They serve lawyers, and I got really close with the in-house counsel there, and had a newfound appreciation um, for for the attorneys in the in the function. And what I learned is that communications and lawyer in the in the in the legal shop they tend to have a lot in common, <laughs> and the biggest one is this. When the business has a problem, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to handle. It goes to one or two places, legal or comms. And so it really helps to be in sync and, and, and sort of problem solving work some of those through. But I right, but I would say that when you have a problem, then, then legal and communications need to be working together as equals. I agree. Uh, and, and I don't, don't think that, because quite often if legal takes the lead, they'll just say, don't say anything because we're going to put the organization at risk. So say nothing. And I don't think that's the right response. Yeah, sometimes, I mean, I completely agree with you on reporting. It does happen. What I tend to find is the in-house counsel, their job is to help the business figure out what it wants to achieve with less risk. If you're working with outside counsel, so a law firm for hire, you don't have someone in-house, they're the ones that tend to be no more often because they don't want their client to get in trouble. Uh, neither here nor there, though, I completely agree with you on the reporting structure and the, you know, co-equal partners and problem solving. That and as uh, I've had a boss before tell me, uh, lawyers give advice. So it's, it's advice. They don't tell you what to do. That's right. Um, I imagine the business says that about comms too, because <laughs> uh, we've all been there. <laughs> um, we're here at 40 minutes or 42 minutes uh, into this. So we're going to go to questions. If I, if I could, just before we jump to questions, we have a second. I did want to pull up um, the, the run folks through the demographic slide because we have a minute to show them, but you know, um, uh, that, that second one here is, this was, remember, beginning of uh, 2020, we talked about the, um, um, the great resignation, even, even before that started to happen, 28% of respondents are uh, fully employed, and this one here is fully employed, but open to opportunities. So PR people and comms folks are definitely open to, um, to moving around. And that these are your subscribers. Do you have anything to add here? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've had I had a headhunter once uh, say to me because people were offering advice uh, uh, to questions that were coming up uh, among people in my community, in my network. Uh, and this headhunter said, "Well, why would anybody want to listen to their advice? They're all a bunch of unemployed losers." And uh, I took exception to that because the vast majority of the people that get the job of the week newsletter are not out of work and they're not uh, necessarily even looking for work, but they want to keep uh, connected with the job market. They want to keep their pulse on the community. They want to read job descriptions and understand what other companies are looking for and what other people are looking for, uh, for all these positive reasons, not negative reasons. And I don't think that their advice uh, would come under the category of a bunch of unemployed losers. I agree. A um, couple other quick things. A lot of folks are in-house, 60%. Uh, and, and a sizable uh, population of consultants and, uh, and freelancers. Uh, we looked at B2C, B2B, right? That breakdown there, it's, you know, fairly well, uh, fairly broad distribution across those different functions. And then this is the, the one I really want to get to you is 64% uh, with 20 plus years of experience. That's substantive. Um, it, it is. So very, very seasoned uh, senior uh, uh, comms folks taking the survey. And then of course, uh, most of the respondents are here in the, in the US and um, we'll make sure um, you can get a copy of these slides at the end of the survey and the, uh, the full study, if you wanna see it is out on SlideShare. I don't think there's any registration required to download You can find it on Ned's 
um, Ned's uh, uh, Job of the Week site, Ned's JOTW. Um, and uh, and I, I've written about, uh, you know, a half dozen articles every year on the study, slicing up different aspects of the data and taking unique takes. And with that, and that concludes the, the presentation part. Thank you all for, for, you know, coming along. If there's questions, we'd be glad to take a, take a whack at any questions folks have. Thank you so much, uh, Ned and Frank. We have a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do them in the order that we received them. Um, and if we don't get to them all, that's totally fine. Feel free to email me any questions that you have and we can make sure that they are addressed. So first question, um, do you think that media is making it harder to contact the right journalist or editor because they are simply overwhelmed or maybe because of the major churn among media employee employees? What are your thoughts? Yes, yes, and other reasons as well. But I agree, they are making it harder, I think. Yeah, I definitely think they're overwhelmed. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I, I, I've had a blog, I've run a blog on marketing PR for 12 years or so, right? And I, so, I, you know, I'm not a big old reporter from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal of that magnitude, but I get an awful lot of pitches. And a lot of them are, you know, SEOs and digital marketers moonlighting as PR. And it'll be, you know, hey, quick question. And when you click and open it, it's like, we saw you wrote about this article and they linked to something you wrote in 2013. And they're asking you to link to some new resource. My point is it's, it's all automated. It's very impersonal. The people that are pitching clearly have no clue about PR, media relations. They're not interested in me or the people that I'm trying to write for. Um, and they're just kind of begging for links. And if you're a, a big time reporter at a traditional publication, you're getting a hundred of these a day. And so wading through um, the, 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 the good, the good, the good, the, the chaff from the wheat, the good folks that are offering good stories from those that are just kind of noise, I think gets real tedious. You know, this has been a problem for a long time and I think it's just gotten worse. You know, I, I don't think of that as pitching. I think of that as scamming, but I get, I get a lot of those too. I, I never really thought of it as being legitimate pitches, but they'll say, uh, I saw this uh, article on your website, and it's a job of the week from uh, 2009. And I think you have uh, an outdated link and we'd like to update it for you. And we'd like you to run our content. And I'm thinking 2009, huh? Yeah. So th they have no idea really what, uh, what it's about or who my audience is. They're just throwing stuff against the wall, hoping I, uh, I'll take their content and post it for free on my site. I, I'll tell you what, for the legit uh, PR folks out there in the trenches doing media relations, there's a survey that Muckrack put out. Uh, they do their annual state of uh, journalism survey. And one of the things that, uh, that comes up in the data every year, so they're asking journalists these questions, is do you like follow-ups, right? I'm not a big follow-up guy. I, I think that it's annoying people. I kind of think reporters, have, you know, if they want a story, they'll get back to you. You know, if they like it, they'll see it and they'll get back to you. But one of the things that they found in that study is reporters saying, yeah, we're okay with a follow-up, with a follow-up. You know, a week later, if they didn't see it, go ahead and, you know, feel free to follow up. It's all right. Just don't be a nag. Uh, but they're, they're looking for legitimate stories. They like PR people that are bringing good ideas to the table. And uh, if you write a good pitch, they'll respond in kind. This might take you a little longer to get through. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We have another question. Um, my company tries to avoid taking stances on political or social issues so it can focus solely on its business functions. Is there value in taking these stands? You'll anger half your audience if you take a political stand and a percentage if you take a stand on social issues. Thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I, I agree. Uh, and there are times when there's, there's no benefit by taking a stand because what does that stand really say? It, you, you would take a stand if you're your business, uh, if the market that you're in is related to that to that issue, for example, uh, if you make paper, uh, then you're obviously a big consumer of uh, products from the forest uh, and chemicals, and you're polluting. But we all need paper, so uh, taking issues on a uh, environmental issue, take, taking a stand on an environmental issue and talking about the need of your own company to become, to, to move into more and more environmentally responsible processes to make your products, that to me would be legitimate. Uh, but if you make pillows, for example, and you come out and you're talking about uh, foreign relations 
there, there's no connection and I see no no value. Uh, it's a it's a real disconnect. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I, um, there, there was, there's been a number of surveys, other surveys and other organizations that have put out in the last few years that are, I, I felt like really pushing this narrative that brands should take a stand in politics. So uh, in what's been 2018 or 2019, when that first started making a lot of noise, I'm not commissioned a survey of my own, independent of the JOTW survey. Um, I ran it through a panel on SurveyMonkey. Uh, so, you know, I had confidence interval, um, probability of, re uh, of uh, repeating the results. And what I found was um, uh, if you take a stand that people disagree with, they're more likely to take an action, right? So if you take, an, if you take a stand that someone agrees with, that they might support you. But if you take a position that they disagree with, they will go out of their way to avoid you. Um, and that was kind of real eye-opening. I, I, my advice to clients and to companies is to tread super carefully. I think it can be a distraction um, depending on the, on, the, on the issue and you can really get bogged down. Like it's getting involved in that can wind up taking more time and resources than you, than you thought it would. I think that's something different than the social issues, right? As, as the survey here noted, and, and there I'm a big believer that you should act, you know, go do it. If you, again, if you wanna be inclusive, go be inclusive. Don't make a, a lot of statements about it. And I think the role of comms there is to be that conscious of the organization. I hope that helps. Thank you. We still have a couple questions left, so I wanted to make sure we get through those. Um, why do major agencies still assign media follow-ups to junior staff? They don't have full knowledge of the subject matter and are expected to bother media without sufficient targeting. Thoughts around that? I'll let you take I, that, Frank. You're I couldn't agree more. I, I, I thought this is backwards for my whole career. Uh, I've been doing PR for 20 years. I still do quite a bit of pitching. I think it. Um, I think it's useful to have that experience to to be able to understand how you fit in the context of a larger story. That's something that you get with time. It's not a numbers game. It's not teeing up a list in a in a media database and blasting it out. I, I, I think more pitches aren't going to help you. I think it's targeted and relevant, and all of the things that we've seen in every tips post for the last twenty years. I think it's really coming true. And if you aren't doing that, it's going to be harder and harder. So I completely agree with you, 100%. Um, I, I think senior people should be doing pitching and they, and they ought to be mentoring, right? We, we have a role, if you're a senior practitioner, you've been doing this a while, you have, a, you have an obligation to you know, teach the younger folks that are up and coming to give them a chance to guide them and uh, you know, not just in their careers, but in, you know, in, in, but in, in, in functions like this every day. PR makes a bad name for itself. Like blasting out a bunch of pitches doesn't help us as an industry either, right? We can do better, we should. Definitely. Do you think that communicators measure things like clicks and reach because it's easy? Is it because we don't know how to measure results? What are your thoughts around that? Yes and yes. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I agree. Yes, yes and no. Um, so let me explain. Yes, yes, it's easy. Um, and it, but it's also a directional metric, right? Because outcomes in my world in business to business technology, these are typically complicated products with a long sales cycle, many touch points, 11 pieces of content is a stat that gets thrown out. They often have six different departments that have to weigh in on procurement. So if you're selling a piece of software or SaaS software, software as a service, that's a quarter million dollars for enterprise, it's gonna take you six or nine months to get through that. So getting to the outcome and understanding the role of communications had and improve it is a complicated, Thing. Um, and so I think the, those metrics are directional, but you always got to, you know, keep your eye on the prize. Um, I, I track metrics just like that. And then, uh, you know, I had a client the other day that is a, a SaaS provider tell me they sold, um, uh, it was $170,000 subscription. Uh, and the prospect cited a particular piece that I had done for them and then had downloaded. And they'd implemented some of the advice and said it had helped them. It's very gratifying. That's anecdotal. I wrote that down. We put it in the tracker. Make sure we don't forget it. I thank them for sharing that with me because the client's the one that has the data. I would never see that otherwise as a as a as an agency. But that's 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 kind of the approach. And that's you know it's a SaaS product, so it's recurring revenue for them. Um, that's that's where we want to go, but it's really hard to get there. So I think uh, yes and no and 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 some maybes there. That's but my that's, take. But you're actually what you're describing is marketing communications. You're talking about if the goal is a sale 
And yes, yeah. it's some sales uh, are very complicated uh, or the actual number of customers. For example, when you're advertising uh, or, or, or writing stories uh, and putting up ads in the Pentagon for a, a fighter jet, uh, the number of people that walk by and look at those ads on, on the billboards uh, is pretty high. The number of people that are actually gonna make a decision to buy a fighter jet is very small. Mm -hmm. uh, but but when you're, you're communicating to sell something, uh, that's different than if you're communicating to uh, change behavior or uh, improve engagement or uh, help uh, employees with a new program. All, those are all, I think, more of a strategic communication uh, effort. And there has to be a better metric than just I opened the document uh, and therefore the, the program was a success. Yeah, I certainly think that's true. I mean, surveys is the old standby, right? If you're trying to uh, improve your reputation, you've got to benchmark that before and after. Um, you want to make sure that it's statistically valid. Um, so that, that can cost some money. I think one of the other um, good metrics, particularly on that line, along that line of thinking that is um, what they call branded search. So people go to a search engine and specifically type in your name. If you're big enough, you might be able to see that in Google Trends. If you don't have that search volume, you can see it in um, in Google AdWords. So AdWords is a, you know, it's a PPC pay-per-click program, but they have some keyword planners that will give you some of those metrics and you can track them over time. If you're seeing increased search volume, clearly you're building awareness. People are entering, they're not coming to Google searching for whatever the category is that you're in, they're searching for your brand. I think that's a really good metric. Uh, yeah, and, and it should also be the goal, right? So we, we we're going to execute this, we're, we're at this particular place on that metric that you just mentioned, this Google metric. And our goal is to get, maybe increase that by 5%. And we come up with a plan to reach the right people. And then at the end of that particular campaign, you go back in, you look at that metric and you see if you raised it by 5%, then you can say it was successful. Yeah, uh, uh, ditto for corporate communications, right? In, or excuse me, internal comms. Um, getting busy employees that get, you know, several dozen emails a day to open up your uh, internal communications email can be a big challenge. So interim metric, but what's the, what's the long term, right? You're, you're doing, hopefully you're doing your employee surveys and kind of tracking that on a quarterly basis. If you aren't, you can see that stuff on Glassdoor and some of the reviews and, and other areas, uh, uh, external sources that, that where people will vocalize their frustrations and or praise for you in a public forum. Sometimes if you have a uh, if you have a uh, campaign plan that's uh, around safety, I've seen a lot of uh, gold quill programs that were aimed at some kind of safety program. Uh, and, and the end result, the goal, the desired goal is reduced uh, loss man hours, reduce injuries. Uh, and th there that, that translates to increased productivity. Uh, so that's the real goal. Uh, but you can't just say we put out these uh, internal releases uh, and that that won the day for us. But there are ways you can show that people uh, became more engaged with a, with a safety program. And then the safety program uh, ultimately resulted in reduced lost man hours or uh, increased productivity. So there are ways you can put one-on-one -on -one together and come up with uh, what, what you're looking for. The key is you're thinking about it. You're asking the right questions. I think it's good to track those interim metrics and keep your eye on the long-term goal. So so you got, you know, you, you're not going to get to a result if you don't put the effort in right? to measure it. All right. Well, I don't think we have time for any more questions. I apologize. We had a couple more. Um, for those of you that submitted questions or for those of you that have additional questions, um, you can see Frank and Ned's contact information on the slide here. And if you, if anything, also send them to um, learning at IABC.com and we'll make sure that those are addressed as well. Um, before I close out and do anything formal, um, Frank, Ned, do you have any final comments you'd like to make to the audience before we if, close if out? People, if people send us those questions, can we make sure that not just the people who sent the questions get our answers, but that everybody can see those questions and answers? Yeah, we can definitely um, put that attached to the slides or add it to the recording Good. as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Another thing, thanks for coming. Thanks for spending some time with us. Hope you have a wonderful and safe holiday. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, um, Frank and Ned, for sharing these findings and these learning opportunities for us. Um, as a reminder, a recording 
of the a copy of today's recording will be found on the IABC website. And if you have any educational, um, future educational content you'd like to share, please complete the short survey at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much to everybody that attended today, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day, as well as a safe and wonderful holiday season. Take care, everyone, and we will see you in the new year. Bye. Thank you.